Come up and meet new friends. Come on, come up the back. Brilliant. Right, we'll get... Can I just make the point, as I've been making to a few people, that you are all adults and you can do whatever you want? Um, I used to be a teacher, so I used to be able to compel people to do things, which is <laughs> awesome. But if you're sitting by yourself and I ask you to turn to the person next to you, you're going to feel a little bit sad and lonely. So at least go within talking distance to someone, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Brilliant. Come on in, guys. Grab a seat. Not quite started yet. Just prop the door open. It's all good. Be welcoming. Encourage people. Yeah. Stop popping the windows, yeah, let's do. Right. Good morning. How are we all, people? That shocked you, didn't it? I just literally saw people go, what the <laughs> hell was that? Are we all well? Brilliant. Brilliant. I am particularly talking to you guys on the front row because we can't afford another lockdown. So please tell me you're well. Uh, day two. Is it day two for most of you or some of you here just for today? And who's here just for today? A few of you. Okay. Uh, those of you who were yesterday, did you have a good day? Yeah, was it amazing? Uh, most importantly, did you manage to blag your way into some kind of vendor do last night and get loads of free drinks? That's yeah. No, you did Oh, mate. You, yeah, it is a thing. It genuinely is a thing. You'll be watching out for it next time. That's the sole reason for downstairs. Did you not realize that? <laughs> uh, great to see you all back. Uh, it's lovely, isn't it? But being back in the real world doing these kind of things face-to-face, -face, it's very nice to see you. Uh, just as a quick... Let's just get you warmed up. If you think you are the person in the room who has traveled the furthest to get here, stand up for me. Oh, this is going to be good. Right, I'm going to start the back. Oh, you, you're, you've instantly <laughs> gone, no, it's not me. Kensington's not going to cut it today. Right. <laughs> who do we have over here? You're from Limerick in Ireland. Does anyone believe they've come further than Limerick? If, if so, tell me in five lines Just how far you've travelled. So that was Limerick today. Where have you travelled from? From Nelson Mandela University. I could guess where that is, but would you like to tell us where that is? Wow. I think... I didn't do great at geography at school. I think South Africa is further than Limerick. Just just slightly. Although, depending on how you travel, it could take just as long to get here if you go here, Lingus. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, and another quick question. Uh, I think this is my eighth learning technologies. Who's been to more learning technologies than me? Fabulous. How many do you think you've been to? Maybe 12. Wow. And where do you travel in from? From Switzerland. Every year. You come. Oh, that's brilliant. Fantastic, amazing, brilliant. One at the back there as well. Yeah, who was at the back? Who's been, who's been to learning technologies that often? You've got a seat with your name on it. Brilliant. How many have you been to, do you reckon? 18. That's pretty good. Uh, I'm not sure why they were allowing minors into this conference 18 <laughs> years ago. That seems unethical to me. Oh, brilliant. Uh, so... I'll level with you guys. Uh, I've been here both days. I did some sessions yesterday. They were fabulous, but I'll be honest, I've been looking forward to this session, and if I wasn't cheering it, I'd be sat there, so I will sit there. Um, I think it's going to be an absolutely fabulous session. Doug's a great speaker, and I'm sure we'll want you to get involved, so please feel free to, to chip in. Would you like them to chip in when things pop into their heads or wait absolutely. till the end? I think we yeah. just, yeah. yeah. I'm good at shutting people down. I'll be good. Yeah, yeah, it's that teaching um, experience. Yeah. <laughs> sit down, shut up. <laughs> Focus on your work. Uh, so, yeah, so if anything pops into your mind and you want to ask it, just make it obvious and, and either myself or my colleague will pop down, we'll grab a little mic so that we can make sure everybody in the room hears the question um, and we'll go like that. Does that sound all right to everybody? Yeah? Brilliant. In which case, uh, one of the things I've been trying to do on all the sessions I've run is to really generate a sense of FOMO for people who aren't in this room. Now, it's obviously going to be slightly more challenging because we're going to have to go through the roof. Uh, but what I want you to do when I, when I ask you to welcome Doug to the stage is just go absolutely wild and crazy like you're at the Wembley Arena and make him feel really welcome. And then anybody who's still milling around outside will be like, whoa, what's going on in there? I need to go in there. Um, and then I'll convince them that there's a £10 cover charge and then we'll all be good. Okay, so, so I'm going to welcome him to the stage. You're going to go wild and crazy. So ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Please welcome to the stage Doug Belshaw. <laughs> Thank you.
You'd never guess that Anthony was a comedy promoter, would you? I mean, like, yeah, so um, I am Doug. We've got loads to get through this session. You're going to have to talk to other people, even if you're an introvert or an ambivert like I am. Um, I've just quickly, sneakily put this slide on the front of my slides, which you can download and use however you want. This is the Verso Books website. Now, I, as you can probably gather from being from a co-op, I'm a little bit left-wing. And so this is a radical publisher. If you're interested about the future of work, not from a really top-down capitalist way of thinking about it, this, I can recommend the following books. Automation and the Future of the Work, A Future of Work by Aaron Bastani. Awesome. Fully Automated Luxury Communism, the best, okay? Um, which other one have I read? Uh, there's another one. Oh, The New Dark Age by James Bridle, yes? These are all fantastic books. I am a subscriber. I get all of their books for free on ebook every single month, versobooks.com. Okay, little advert for them. Um, the hashtag for this session is, in addition to the normal learning technologies one, T5S4. Apparently, it's important to tweet using those hashtags. And also, feel free to use the hashtag Keep Badgers Weird. Yeah, that's, that's one we'll be using as well. If you want to download these slides, I'll put this on the screen at the end again. bit.ly forward slash, and the capitalization matters, LTUK22 dash badges. Badges in lower case. I'll put that on the screen again at the end. Has anyone come into this session with a burning question that they have to have answered by the end of this session. And I'm gonna do a really long teacher pause. No, okay, right. So we're gonna start off by talking to each other and I'm gonna model, as a good teacher would do, um, what I expect from you. So if you really knew me, and this is going to link to badges, I promise. If you really knew me, you'd know that dot, 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 finishing the sentence. So for me, if you really knew me, you didn't know that one of the things I enjoy most in the entire world is going up a mountain with a friend drinking whiskey. Right? That is one of my favorite things to do in the world. This guy here, who's six foot ten, and I met yesterday because he lives in London, is Brian Mathers. Brian M. Mathers on Twitter. Um, and he has done most of the illustrations that you're going to see in this slide deck. So for me, if you really knew me, you'd know that I really like going up mountains with friends drinking whiskey. Turn to the person next to you, just a minute, minute and a half, finish off that sentence, talk to each other, and then we'll find out some of the good ones. Do that now. <laughs> Microphone. Yes, we'll just get some... Let's get some good things. if he could be bringing those conversations to an end. Okay, there we go. Right, so we'll start at the back, as Don did. So has anyone got a great one that they want to share with the rest of the room from kind of the back or the middle of the room before we get to the enthusiastic people at the front? If you really knew me, you'd know that, dot, dot, dot. Anyone? I'm not sure. I don't know really which one, but if you really knew me, if you really knew me, although I sound American, I'm actually from the Philippines. Nice one. That's exactly the kind of thing I want to hear. Fantastic. Good. Good. Another one, and including the front this time. I want to go, really can I go over to this mini lumberjack convention that's going on over here? <laughs> so, right. You look really animated when you guys were talking. So what, what did you discover? He's assumed eye contact. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll promise you, if you really knew me, you would know that um, I have marked Ethiopia's top goal scorer of all time. As in, in a football match? Wow, wow. very good. That's I've got lots of questions. 
no, 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 no. We don't put that bit in. No, 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 no. Just leave it there. I used to mark Michael Carrick when I was younger, but I don't say that he absolutely skimmed me every time. Like, I don't put that bit in as well. One more, one more. Thank you for that one. One more. If you really knew me, you'd know that. Go for it. Yeah. It's not mine. It's what I found out from Julian. That his, um, his favorite ever job was being a grave digger. Really? Again, lots of questions, which we'll do, get do to. You wanna, do you want to caveat that, yeah. caveat that Julian? No. Wow. Why did you stop doing that, Julian? Didn't like working the grave shift. We. Right, so. See, you got in before me. I was going to say it's a dying trade. <laughs> Um, the reason I want to kind of bring that out is because it's really important. You know, in the, earlier in the panel session, we were talking about like just reimagining L&D and reimagining what we're doing. I want to really encourage you that you can issue badges. Anyone can issue a badge for anything. So literally, this is a fun badge, but we have issued these badges to our clients, the whiskey test badge. Like, are you cool enough to hang out with us and drink whiskey? Yeah, you can, drink, you can issue any kinds of badges for anything. So the things we're going to cover in this short session our instruction, which we've just done, um, why we need open badges, what are they, who's using them, how are they issued, the difference between credentialing and recognition, which I think is an important one, um, Trojan mice as opposed to Trojan horses, how you do change management in organizations, how to get started with badges, verifiable credentials, which is like the next iteration of open badges, and then just loads of useful reading and resources. When you download the slides, you can use those in your own organization. I also have some spare slides that I was going to put in the presentation, but didn't have time for, so you can download this, those as well. So first of all, why do we need badges? That's like the $64,000 question here. Why have I been unreasonably excited about a metadata standard for 11 years? Well. For the purposes of this audience, I would say, well, there's three things here. First of all, learning happens everywhere. Learning doesn't just happen in educational institutions in like your organization. Learning happens in the garden when you're kind of growing tomato plants. Learning happens when you're on the football pitch like we had before. Learning happens when you're learning a new language or you move to a new country. Learning happens everywhere, but we don't necessarily capture that learning in a way that we can use um, for recognition, for credentialing, that kind of thing. The second thing, and again we heard it this morning, there's a skills gap. But is that skills gap actually a credentialing gap? Have people got the skills, they just can't prove them because actually algorithms are looking at our CVs. So is the skills gap partly or entirely a credentialing gap? And then thirdly, how can we especially during a pandemic and coming out of it and hybrid working, how can we provide recognition of ourselves holistically as human beings at a distance, like behind a Zoom screen, that kind of thing. So those three things, I would say, for this audience, may be the top, my top three reasons for using badges. So the point I'm trying to make, and again, these are all Brian's images, you can use them under a Creative Commons license, is that your experiences, marking the Ethiopian top goal scorer, um, coming from the Philippines, digging graves, all of these experiences have value no matter how weird and wonderful they are. My experience of being a teacher means that if I can get teenagers caring about history, I can get a, a room full of slightly jaded L&D professionals interested in my talk as well, yeah? So everything is transferable skills. What I'm talking about today isn't throwing out the baby with the bathwater, you know? I have a, do a doctoral certificate. I have things, I'm invested in this system here, the old school credentials. What I'm talking about today are the little pebbles in the jar, the things which round out who you are to paint a fuller picture of you as an actual human being rather than just your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just here for rhetorical effect. Um, <laughs> there we go. So painting a, a much uh, like broader picture. So I'm guessing you don't have all these experiences that we've just been talking about on your LinkedIn profile. I'm guessing that most of your LinkedIn profiles look quite similar, which can be useful, but also isn't great for actually showing who you are at a distance. Wouldn't it be great if we had much more three-dimensional CVs with all of those softer skills, those human skills that we talk about, empathy, teamwork, resilience, communication, actually popping up out of our CVs, as well as all of those harder skills, I went to this place and did this thing. Badges can be used for almost anything, as I hope to show you during this presentation. They can be used for recognizing, um, uh, for job opportunities, getting people into a job. They can be used on the job. They can be used for online learning and professional development. You can use badges 
for literally anything. And what I want to introduce you to today are just to some of those different ways maybe of using badges that maybe you've come into this session then thinking about. So what are these things? What are these mythical unicorn things that uh, Doug's talking about? Well, badges are actually a really simple thing. They're just metadata hard-coded into an image. And the metaphor I usually use for this, I've got two kids, one's uh, 11, one's 15. When I'm baking cakes with them, it would be ridiculous for us to put the flour and the sugar and the eggs, bake the cake, and then after the cake's been baked, try and get the sugar and the eggs and the flour out of that cake. You can't do it. Same kind of way, once the metadata is baked into the badge, you can't get it out. Yeah? That, that's the way that it works. So the metadata is the kind of things that you, when you go to a library and you look up the Dewey Decimal System, or when you send a message on WhatsApp and it tells you when it was sent and who you send it to, that is metadata. And the metadata you put into a badge are things like the name of the badge, who issued it, who it was issued to, what the person had to do to get it, if there's any evidence, does it align with any standards? Does it expire? When I used to be a lifeguard, I had to go back and do my lifeguard training and be recertified. Does this badge expire after a certain amount of time? Um, now, the evidence part of this is really important. This is the reason why I've been so excited about it. This is why I work for Mozilla, who, who invented the Open Badges Standard. Badges can be evidence-based. So instead of me just saying, I can talk to a room full of people about anything you want, um, I've got a video of me in a badge showing you that. It's not just a claim, it's a bunch of evidence. Secondly, they're stackable. And what I mean by that is that we'll talk about pathways later on, that's important, but also different organizations can stack badges together. If this organization over here has a great program on leadership um, and then you want to go a step further or a step sideways, you can build on each other's badge pathways. Yeah? So you can work together as organizations. They're transferable. So instead of being stuck in your LXP or siloed platform, you can take your badges with you because it's an open standard and it's free and open, which means anyone can issue a badge for anything, which scares some people to death. Yeah, but it's great. So how the open badges infrastructure works in practice. Um, really simple overview diagram. If you trust your online banking, if you trust your online shopping, you can trust the open badges standard uses the same kind of protocols um, at work. So anyone, might be an education provider, might be your organization, might be an individual, can issue a badge to anyone for anything. If that person accepts it, which they don't have to, if they accept the badge, they can choose to display it publicly on the web, they can choose to store it privately on their hard disk on their computer, whatever they do. And then people who might be trying to give them a job, going into university, their mates, their mum, whoever, is looking at their badge, and they can verify it was issued to them using the standard. They can click through and verify that this badge hasn't been tampered with and was issued to this person. This is just an example really quickly of a couple of badges I've been issued. This was one for signing a declaration saying that I agreed with this manifesto. This one was for coming to the help of people like David Hasselhoff um, in an online forum and, and preventing abuse, um, which I thought was great. So you can issue badges for anything. You can issue badges to yourself. I've seen someone apply for a job just with self-issued badges because they didn't have the credentials they needed. So they invented badges, issued them to themselves, and then got the evidence and used it as a mini portfolio. Yeah, you can do anything you want. You can endorse badges. So your organization or you as an individual issues a badge and another organization or your boss endorses that badge. You can do all of these really interesting kinds of things. The people behind badges, because I'm always skeptical and interested when people are trying to sell something to me, I'm selling something which is free. Um, Mozilla, who are people behind Firefox, who I used to work for, they invented the Open Badges standard and kind of incubated it. They spun out the Badge Alliance as a nonprofit, and now IMS Global Learning Consortium, who some of you will be aware of because they look after um, different technology standards in education, um, they are the stewards of the Open Badges standard for the last five years. But I put at the bottom here that there's a really large and active community, and Open Badges would not be the massive worldwide popular thing that it is if it wasn't for that community, thinking about different use cases, um, trying and asking questions and evolving the standard. The, uh, what, a couple more things just before I ask you to turn to the person next to you again. You might have come into this session talking about things like micro-credentials, verifiable credentials, open recognition, digital badges, um, open badges. I once had someone after a session like this say, Doug, 
this is never gonna take off unless you call them open medallions. <laughs> I try to keep a straight face, but the point is that you can call them whatever you want as long as they align with the standard, yeah? You can call them knickknacks. You can call them, um, I don't know, like little widgets. You can, it doesn't matter what you call them as long as they align with the open badges standard. That's the important bit. Don't like the word badges? Don't use it. Higher education hates the word badges, so they always use micro-credentials. If you want to use that, great, go for it. Doesn't matter. So I said I'd say where I'm from. I'm from We Are Open Co-op. This is a co-op I set up six years ago on International Workers' Day, May the 1st. Um, with these crazy people. Laura is American based in Germany. John is based in London. Brian did all the imagery that you've just seen. Um, he's over there. Anna is our intern now, our collaborator. She's based in, Germ um, in Germany as well. She's doing feminist pedagogy badges at the moment, which is quite interesting. We are part of um, a, a kind of a, a network of co-ops as well, tech co-ops. Instead of scaling ourselves as an organization, we work with other co-ops. So we bring in skills from other co-ops. We work on a kind of a rhizomatic network model. So you can see where we're based. We work with all different kinds of organizations, digital transformation, sense making, badges, all different kinds of things. So this is Cotech, coops.tech. Um, we, because we work so closely with one another in solidarity, we can quickly like um, work in alignment. It's really, really re useful. Last thing, then before we turn to the person next to you, Anna, who's our intern, we never had an intern before. So we thought, right, we're going to devise a program for her because we're kind of educators. So we did, um, and we developed this whole program, and we included badges, of course. Why wouldn't we include badges? So we were like, right, we've got all this sorted. Anna starts her internship. As Mike Tyson famously said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, Anna is lovely and wonderful, but she didn't really want all of the badges that we were issuing her. In fact, there's this word in German, which some of you might know, I'm not sure, which basically means jumping over your own shadow. Yeah, it might be the same in Dutch, I don't know. Jumping over your own shadow. And she wanted a badge for kind of getting over herself, being confident enough to speak on behalf of the co-op and to share her ideas in our Slack channel and that kind of thing. She wanted a badge for that, to recognize, give her the confidence for that. So she, we developed with her a shadow jumping badge. We also developed all different kinds of badges, like picking up the reins of a project and taking it over for us, um, finishing her onboarding, learning how to use our planning systems, all these different kinds of badges, some of which we had kind of devised in advance, some of which she wanted. And that's the important thing here. Um, you have to meet people where they are. You have to kind of recognize people for what they want to be recognized for. So this is her badges. These are her badges in her backpack or portfolio, as you can see here. Um, and so what it's doing is it's describing her employment. She finishes her internship. She doesn't just get a letter from us saying, oh, yeah, she was a great intern. She gets all these badges as well, proving that what she's done is really valuable to us. So instead of it being a prescriptive pathway, like a university prospectus, it's more of like a story of your own life, like an autobiography, like a descriptive pathway, which I think is much better. There's nothing wrong with having prescriptive badges that people have to earn, but what about actually recognizing what people have done and what they're good at? Um, for those of you, obviously, in, in L&D, you might want to hire people based on badges as well as your current kind of criteria. You might want to issue badges for professional development. You might want to form teams based on having similar badges or different badges as well. It's a really nice way of showing how people can come together um, in a work setting as well. Um, the, the City and Guilds logo and stuff is on different slides because they're our clients. Um, and City and Guilds are a really good example of, of people who have pivoted to issuing thousands and thousands of badges, like in the last five years or so. Are employers recognizing badges? Yes, they're still a little bit confused, as you can imagine, like, oh, what, what are these? But if someone puts a badge in front of you with evidence in, of course you're gonna look at it. You know, I'm helping my clients hire people. They're looking at badges. They're looking at alternative credentials as well. So that was a lot, but what kind of badge, if you turn to the person next to you, what kind of badge would you personally like to earn and why? It doesn't have to be a work one. It could be for anything you want. But if you turn to the person next to you, just for a couple of minutes, what kind of badge, based on some of the stuff I've talked about, would you like to earn and why? Off you go. <laughs> so hopefully one person didn't just completely dominate that conversation. Hopefully both of you got a chance to talk. But let's do the same thing again. 
All right, let's have an example, a few examples of the kinds of badges that people in this room would love to earn, as well as why you might want to earn them. So, quick show of hands, anyone? Oh. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get a badge for having raised a child to adulthood, to the age of 18. <laughs> and, and the... She doesn't hate me. There's a mild dislike, but, but not hatred, right? Absolutely. So the, the reason you want to earn that is because you've survived, yeah? You've managed, and she has as well. As, as the father of a 15-year-old boy, I salute you. Cool, that's a great one. Thank you for kicking us off with that one. Another one, another example of a badge you might want to earn and why. Yeah, I would like a badge for taking creative risks. Um, because something I do a lot in my work is, is going choosing creative directions. They don't always work, but having a safe place to fail in that would be nice. That like you try something that didn't necessarily work, but keep going. You know, it's, we need to take those risks creatively and you know, encourage the, the behaviors we want to see. And why would you want that? Who would you show that batch to? Would it be for you? Do you or know? Would it be... I think it would just be more self validation, yeah. to be yeah, honest yeah. with you. Yeah, I think that's what I would like, yeah. regardless of. It would keep you going. It would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it would. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. Can we have a third one? I've got one over there. You can do it. Just shout. There we go. Um, yeah, I'd like a badge for understanding badges and being able to communicate the benefit of them. Yes. Oh. Um, like that. Badgeception. Yeah, we're having, that. we're having conversations in the NHS at the moment about uh, digital credentials. Oh, hello, Patricia. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, I want yeah, the network there's, about. there's clear huge utility for, for such a, a facility that enables staff to move across different clinical settings. So why would that be useful? Just because you'd be able to show what you knew when you moved between different parts of the NHS? Yeah, exactly yeah. that. Yeah, so right. it's, you know, the, at, the, at the very basic level, it stops people from having to redo training that they've already done. Right. Which wastes clinical hours. Yeah. Uh, so one of the early, that's a really good one, and actually one of the first kind of examples of, um, uh, of mobile learning when I was at JISC was exactly about people being able to evidence the fact they've already been shown how to wash their hands, thank you very much. I don't need to keep doing that when they were moving between their junior doctor placements. So badges for that would be really useful. The badge, orator badge, is one that I've already earned. I didn't prepare that today, but back in 2014-15, someone issued me a badge for speaking about badges. So it's entirely possible to get that. So, We'll leave it there, but you can see that they are all quite different, are they? Some of them are for like self-validation. Some of them are to be shown to other people within your organization. Some of them would be for people that you don't know. So the audience of badges is always going to be different too. So who's using badges? I'm going to use five examples here. Obviously, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of organizations. Um, first of all, Obviously, the Open University are issuing badges. Their, their mandate is open learning. And if you go to, if you've never seen this, like openlearn.com uh, is a great website where you can learn all different kinds of stuff. What you can't see here, maybe citizen science, introduction to so social work, history of female protest. You can get badges for a lot of these courses. So for example, here, you know, the Open University, I'll call them digital badges, which is fair enough. You can get badges for introduction to cybersecurity. You can get them for like basic digital skills, all that kind of stuff. You do a free course, you get a badge at the end of it. You've proved that you've got this thing. Stick it on your LinkedIn profile, put on social media, whatever you want. Second example, I don't think most people realize that IBM are huge on badges, like you would not believe. So I'm just gonna show you a few screenshots of this. This is from two years ago when IBM issued their three millionth badge, but by now they'll have issued five million, six million, who knows how many million badges. Now IBM, have an ex they have said publicly that they want to hire fewer people with degrees and more people with badges because it's more just-in-time learning. They can respond to like quick changes in technology. So they've got four different types of badges that they tend to focus on, explorer, mastery, instructor, and author. But they've also got 2,340 different types of badge that they can issue their staff, but also people in the world. Now, if you think about what IBM are doing here, they're providing free learning, and they're doing talent acquisition. So what they're doing is they're finding people who are amazing at this, even though they're just starting their journey, and then they're tapping them on the shoulder and saying, do you fancy coming to like, finish off that journey with us? So all different kinds of stuff, Python, very technical, big data, cloud core, but also they do more generic things, things like agile or working in a digital world 
or even mindfulness and data analytics. So they're issuing a very broad spectrum of badges to try and like, keep people in their organization, but also get people into their organization as well. When you download these slides, follow the links to find out more. The third example, and I was actually talking to someone about this this morning, quite randomly, the Scottish Social Services Council have been issuing badges for about the last eight years. And the reason I like their example is because they're using badges in an innovative way. Now you'll know that organizations produce big, thick reports that sometimes people don't read. <laughs> what the Scottish Social Services Council want is them to issue a report based on evidence and then people to go and put it into practice. So they've got badges for going and putting into practice the recommendations of a report. So they're linking practice to theory and to evidence based on badges, which is a really nice use of, of badges, I think. Badges.sssc.uk.com. My favorite example, because it's not a techie example, is Colorado State University's Certified Gardener Program. I love this example for two reasons. First of all, it's not your usual tech stuff. But second of all, it's a three-part badge system using kind of military insignias. So you can see here, you've got tree identification, pruning, um, and kind of tree placement, like where you'd put your way to plant things. These all level up into uh, this badge called Trees and Shrubs. And then this badge is only one on the Certified Gardener Program Mastery badge. So they kind of level up together. Now, of course, when you've got this badge, you don't need to bother showing these anymore. You just show this one. So when people say, well, what happens when people have got a million badges? Well, if you're on a pathway, you just show the highest level badge that you've got on that pathway. The fifth example I'll give, because I'm a bit of a geek, is Fedora Linux, who have been issuing badges using their own system from about 2013, 14. Now, the grizzly old developers, when this was brought in, were like, we don't need any stinking badges. What are you talking about? But of course, the younger developers were using them, being able to show what they knew, getting badges for all different kinds of stuff, and then they got on board. So you can issue badges for anything, and they, you'll probably have an internal magazine in your organization, um, if it's of a, a decent size. They've got a clickbait badge for people who have managed to write an, uh, an article for their website, which has got more than 1,000 views. So they're encouraging people to write articles that people want to read. And since 2015, that has been awarded 114 times to these people here. So again, a different kind of way of doing badges, recognition. Now I mentioned earlier that you can issue, when you check badges, you can check that that badge was issued to that particular person. If you go to badgecheck.io, there's other ways you can do this too. You can make sure that um, this badge was actually issued to me. This particular badge uh, was issued to me and not to someone else, not someone claiming that they've been issued that badge as well. So just to really emphasize, I'll not go on the third column because I don't know how many developers we've got in this audience, but for earners, it's really useful because you can show what you know and can do. Um, you can collect your badges in a portfolio, which you can then show to different people in different settings. And you can share them on social media as well. So you're not just claiming that you can do something, you're proving it. If you're an issuer, if you're an organization, well, you can break learning down into small chunks, which have value, and you can show the value of those smaller chunks. You can recognize competency-based learning uh, based on proficiency. And you can retain talent, because people can feel that they're still leveling up, even though they've been at your organization quite a while. And retention isn't particularly important at the moment. So I'm going to pause again, again turn to the person next to you. Based on what you've seen other organizations issue, based on what you've heard so far, based on what you already knew, what kind of badges might, be, might it be useful for your organization to issue? Now, if that's too big because you work for a massive organization, think of your department or just whatever unit you think is going to be useful. Just turn to the person um, again. might be a different person. might be the same person. What kind of badges might it be useful for your organization to issue? So just turn around and do that now. Is this like a, a natural silence, which is unusual for a group of people? Is it because I started talking to the people over there? OK, well, let's do what we did last time, which was just to go around and find some examples. We heard all from people presenting as men last time. So can we have people who aren't white men this time? That'd be great. Um, the patriarchy is real. So um, no pressure, but if you would like to suggest something, what kind of badges might it be useful for your organization to issue, then stick up your hand, and we will have a listen to what you've got to say. Yes, over here. Thank you. 
Um, actually, the one that you had on the slide a minute ago gave me a really good idea, the OG badge. Um, I work for a startup, and um, I'm thinking it might be really nice to recognize our like founding customers as right. taking a risk on our product and helping launch our success. Because mm -hmm. um, they've formed a partnership, right? Like We gather a lot of feedback from them. They're part of our customer advisory board. Like hmm. They're, they're fundamental. Valuable. Yeah, they're fundamental to our success. Hmm. And why might that be? Why might that be valuable to them? You, it's valuable to you, sure. right? but why is it valuable to them? Um, well, then it shows them as being innovative and being risk takers, being willing to, right. to take, take those kinds of, uh, of risks and, and try new things. And it, it just could represent um, also just the hard work that the individuals have put into hmm. making it work. Nice, thanks for sharing that. Um, we are actually, uh, one of our clients is gonna be running a session just for people who have earned this badge as like a pre-conference session um, in August at a conference I'm going to in, in the US. So like badges for exclusive membership into a group is a thing, as you can imagine. Uh, so yes, over here. Uh, yeah, actually, because I run a startup, and I think that's actually a brilliant idea, and I might actually steal that, the OG, because I think <laughs> those first customers are so important, and you really love them when they come on board, so I think that's a really nice idea. Nice. So I think one of the things uh, I'm interested in doing is we run an intensive five-week program for women looking to get back into careers in tech, but we have no accreditation for it. Right. And it's sort of, it's just become a much bigger thing very, very quickly, so we're looking at getting accreditation in 18 months, but then I was thinking, well, actually, do you know what? They do five weeks, really intense work, have really good technical skills coming out of it. Maybe, you know, we need to look at badges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, why might the person, I mean, it's sort of kind of obvious, but just to spell it out, why might the person earning that badge think it's a valuable thing? Well, I think because in our space, we've built up a brand. So if you put it on your LinkedIn profile that you've done reboot, it actually means something to somebody. Right. And I don't expect people here to, but it, it, to a certain crowd of people, it does mean something. And I think that badge, it's indicative. They've put so much hard work into that program, like really intense. And I really want them to have something coming out of it. Um, and they would prove, it would, it would be proof rather would than be just proof. being able to claim, oh yeah, I did this yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, and I think with a bit of rigor behind it where we could, I like the idea of it being stackable as well where you mm. can show all 10. So no, mm. I think it's a really interesting idea. Well, just, uh, yeah, that's a wonderful example. My wife moved from being a primary school teacher into being a user researcher for the NHS digital team by getting a badge from Team Treehouse and then working on a project with me to have a, a portfolio. So having that evidence is really important. It's a great, really good example as was that one. Um, anyone else want to share one? Just Yes, over here. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm from South Africa, and we recently developed a, um, a course for our students called Becoming an Open Education Influencer. Right. And so badges would be very valuable then. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one thing. And then the other thing is we, we don't, we have a formal system of awarding the qualifications, but we don't have anything for the co-curriculum, the membership of the choir, then giving evidence that you mm. can work mm. in a team. Mm. So those small credentials to add to the student. And why that would be useful for the student because what, what would they be able to do that they couldn't before? Just to kind of get to the nub of it. Uh, well, we have some values as a university. Our tagline is um, change the world. So we want our students to go out and those type of credentials mm. add to then how do they go out and change the world. Right. Wonderful. Deakin University um, in Australia does something similar to that and become leaders in it. And in fact, when I was talking to Newcastle University, you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm from the Northeast. I don't know if they implemented this, but when I was talking to them about it, they were saying, well, if you were captain of the football team at Newcastle University, kind of prestigious thing, but how would you prove it? So badges for volunteering is like a nice way in sometimes to kind of low stake stuff for organizations. So. Um, Let's just talk about how they're issued, because you might be thinking, this is great, I'm gonna get started. How do I get started? What, how do I issue them? Well, there's at least three different ways you could do this, just to use kind of a dressmaking metaphor. Um, you could build your own bespoke platform, because it's a free and open standard, so you could get developers to build one for you, like the Fedora Linux example. Um, so you could do that. You could use free and open source software. I used to work for Moodle. Moodle has open badges built into their LMS. It's free and open source. You can get plugins for WordPress, lots of different um, CMSs, uh, LMSs, et cetera, which are open source. Install a plugin, you own the data. That's kind of a halfway house. Or you can do off the peg. There are lots and lots of badging systems where it's like a SaaS thing. You create an account, you start issuing badges. The great thing is because it's a free and open interoperable standard is you can start off on one platform and move to another. 
and your learners can take their badges with them. You haven't got that vendor lock-in. So the ones that I've used the most and we are open have used the most are Badger. Badger has literally in the last couple of weeks been acquired by Instruction, the people behind Canvas. So that's going to move to being Canvas badges and Canvas credentials. So a big deal. Moodle, who I used to work for, Open Badge Factory, OpenBadges.me, and Participate. Participate are one of our clients. OpenBadges.me were one of our clients. In fact, all of those have been our clients. Um, the one that I haven't got on there is Credly. And I'm going to use some examples. Credly is owned by Pearson, um, one of the biggest organizations, uh, learning organizations in the world. So badges are a huge, huge deal. I wrote a post about this a few years ago. I should probably update it. We run a wiki called badge.wiki using the same software as uh, Wikipedia. You can have a look on there. And if you're interested in certified platforms, um, then have a look on the IMS Global website as well. So here's an example of me having my badges in a profile. This is the Participate uh, website. I've been issued badges on this platform. So as you'd expect, you can see the badges I've earned on that platform in my profile. But because it's a free and open standard, I'm now on Badger, and I've imported my badges into there. Because it's a free and open standard, I can display my badges anywhere. I can move them between systems. This is an example. Hopefully the GIF works. Here we go. OpenBadges.me. They're based in uh, Yorkshire. They make it really easy to issue badges. Uh, they've got a badge generator in there. Um, you can just create a badge, type in the criteria you want, um, what the name of the badge is, tags, if it expires, all that kind of stuff. And then you can just issue a badge really quickly. So in the time that this GIF is going around, I've created a badge. Yeah, the, the, the difficulty isn't the creating of the badge and issuing it. The difficulty is thinking about, like, do they need to be rigorous? What are we going to issue them for? What's the next step? What's the so what for people? All of the stuff as L&D professionals you have to think about anyway. The issuing of the badge is no really harder than printing out a paper certificate and signing it. It's not particularly difficult. Um, Pathways, I said I'd talk about those. You can do pathways in, in different tools. Not every platform has badge pathways. This is Open Badge Factory. They're based in Finland. Um, we've done some work with them. You can add really interesting logic and constraints on here. So you might say, well, to progress to the next level, you have to have earned four of these six badges to get onto the, the next thing. This is Badger Pathways. They have a similar thing, just looks slightly different. So the idea is that you're, you're um, helping people progress through some options. Now, I'm a gamer. I play PlayStation 4, Xbox Game Pass, Stadia, and literally anything I can get my hands on. And so something like this is just a skill tree. Like this is the FIFA 22 skill tree, and so you level up. Now, I was talking to this lady over here, so I forgot your name, and you were expressing some concern about gamification. Um, badges don't have to be gamified, but you can gamify them as well. You can say, like, this is the next step. If you get to this, this is what's going to happen, that kind of thing. Tie real world stuff to them. I get really motivated by this, as does my 15-year-old son. When I was a teacher, I found that different groups of students and different groups of people got motivated in different ways. So as long as it's not the only way you do things, it's all cool. What I'd love to see is a constellation of pathways. So different organizations or different organizational units working together to create different badges and thinking about how they might interact with one another. That would be awesome. So I'll pause in case you've got any questions of me, because I've had a chance for you've had a chance to talk to each other. But it might be at this stage of the presentation, we're now what 45 minutes in. You might have a question of me that I might not be able to answer. So ask me the hardest questions you possibly can. Here we are at the back. Okay, I hope you do have the answer. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, Open Badge and the kind of Mozilla that started it hmm. is free, but then you've got companies that are charging to help you issue and manage badges. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to understand what is the pros and cons and why would people sell this service and people like me buying it mm -hmm. if it is in fact free? Yeah, sure. So in the same way that open source software is free and you can choose to download and host it on your own machine, on a server or whatever, but people pay organizations either to host open source software or proprietary stuff, it depends what's important for you at different times. So um, with open badges systems, there's ones that focus on pathways. There's ones which have really tight integrations with LMS. There's ones which work in your existing CMS like Moodle. So there's all different platforms. So you can create it from scratch using the free and open standard. It's a bit like, you know, um, some of you here aren't old enough to remember this, but on the web, you used to have to use different browsers for different websites like Netscape, Navigator, and Internet Explorer. This site works best in it, all that stuff. And the reason we don't have to do that anymore 
is because the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, have standards that all web browsers use, which is great. And so we've got this standard, and I'm going to talk about verifiable credentials in a moment, that everyone can use. It's just that the business model is different from the standard. Yeah, that's, that's the deal. Does that answer your question? Cool. I think we had a question here. Yes, thanks. Um, obviously, the eye badging has been around for a while. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are, you're very passionate. Lots of people are passionate. Yes. I'm, I'm passionate, but there are some people say, well, we've tried it, and it's been a lot of money, it's taken a lot of time, it hasn't worked. Some of the issues seem to be around, like, I guess, what you get the credential or the badging for. So mm -hmm. some of your examples were badges for things I've done. So I've been, say, a football captain, one example you mm -hmm. gave. That's a thing you did. Yep, someone could give you that badge, which is different to something that you can do. But I can code Python. So I can, it sounds like I could make a badge today that says I can code Python, but I can't. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like I could still do that. Mm -hmm. So how do you kind of get around the whole things I've done versus things I can do? And how do you know that actually, if anyone can award a badge, I can do what my badge says that I can? Right. Great question, right? Has anyone ever been in a situation where someone has tried to blag them, either personally or professionally, in an interview, pretended that they've got some experience or a qualification that they don't have? Anyone ever been in that position? A few show of hands. It all happens all the time down the pub, right? People like, oh, yeah, I've got this mate who's called. Like, people you do that all the time. Right? We're used to that kind of thing. Put on LinkedIn, like sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. People get found out, that kind of thing. So can you issue a badge to say something that you can't do? Yes, but Doug Belshaw has issued a badge to Doug Belshaw, proving that he is president of the world, yeah? Like it's all about how do we evidence this thing, which is why I think the evidence part of it's really important. Um, the second part of it's interesting when you said that people have tried this, yeah? So they roll out a badge program, they're like, We've tried badges. Well, let's just use an analogy there. We rolled out certificates, and we've tried certificates, and they don't work. Would be a ridiculous thing to say, yeah? We've tried paper certificates. I'm going to use an analogy in a moment uh, with my daughter's certificate with mine. You wouldn't say, well, we've tried paper-based certificates, and they didn't work, yeah? Maybe you weren't using them. People didn't care about them. The reason that they didn't show them off was because they didn't, they didn't matter to anyone. So a badging program, I'm going to talk about Trojan mice in a moment. A badging program isn't really a thing. You're adding badges to a program that you're doing. It might be a change management thing. It might be an upskilling thing or whatever. It's not a badge program. It's something you're going to do that you're adding badges to. Otherwise, it's just a badging program with no content. It doesn't make any sense. The very first mass badging thing that Mozilla ever did was Chicago Summer of Learning in 2013. And they issued tens of thousands of badges to these kids who came and went between organizations in Chicago over the summer. Tens of thousands of badges to these teenagers. And only hundreds of actual teenagers claimed the badges. Because the badges made sense to the organizations who were issuing them, but made no sense to the teenagers earning them. Why would they care? Where do I put them? What's going on here? So the badges have to make sense to your customers, to your staff, to the people who are earning them. That's the important thing. We've got more questions. I'm, do you have a quick follow-up, or do you want to? Well, yeah, yeah. So, so you said you did. Uh, so just because I'm really curious to understand where mm. the evidence bit comes in. Yeah. You did give the example of someone who had created badges for themselves mm. and then s supported them. It's a them. niche example. I, I get that. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, yeah, I'm not trying to kind of, I'm just curious. So how, how would that person put in the evidence behind doing it in a, in a legitimate way, which I think, I think having the legitimate um, approach mm. is fantastic. Sure, so just, just, it empowers quick, that just individual really quickly, so um, there are standards in the world, you know, um, standards for meeting certain criteria, whatever. If you're wishing it to yourself, which I don't see a lot of, to be honest, if you're wishing it to yourself, you'd say, I've met this standard because I've done this work, and you'd put the evidence in there, yeah? I have met this standard. Someone else can come along and validate and endorse it because, you know, you can't earn that badge elsewhere. You had a question, sir. This will be the last one, I'll move on. So what examples have you seen, if any, where organizations are using credentialing and badging to support talent mobility, underrepresented groups in the business, people mm. who wouldn't or typically won't shout about their mm. skills that they have and rely on yeah, so the programs that you've done in it? Yeah, so business. Telefonica specifically wanted to focus on this. They did a, um, one about seven years ago with the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And they were like, okay, you've got extroverts, they come into interviews, and I'm like, 
I'm amazing, I've done this thing, look at this, here's my evidence, whatever. Um, or often not even that's my evidence. Introvert, so a bit like, uh, and they ask a question, um, I can solve a Rubik's Cube? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. If you can get badges for that, that that's telling the story for them. Yeah? It no longer is it you having to like, present yourself like this. But if you're in a role where you don't have to be in sales and marketing, you don't have to do that as part of your job, then badges tell a story maybe that the person can't tell them themselves. Yeah? I'm going to move on for, the, um, for, for time because I want to talk about credentialing versus recognition. And if at any point you've had all you need from this presentation, feel free to vote with your feet. I do not mind. I will not come and hunt you down. There's a difference between credentialing and recognition. Now, did, some of you will have seen the Manchester City game last night. The least said about um, their game management at the end of that um, second half, the, the better. But if you kind of own any sporting thing or any kind of thing where people are being celebrated, yes, there's the man of the woman of the match, but there's also the recognition from the people around them. So that you, get, you get the credential, you get the match ball. Uh, this is a sporting analogy, but you can imagine people winning an award for something. And they often thank the people who have helped them get there, the recognition. There's a difference between the credential and the recognition. The recognition is bigger than the credential. So I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about recognition, because recognition is much more of a peer-to-peer -peer thing, and credentialing is much more of a top-down thing. I said before that certificates can be used as an analogy here. I would just say, in a slightly offhand way, the certificate is just an offline badge. It's like a printed off badge. The real version is the metadata infused version that's on a database somewhere. And can I have another copy of my certificate? Yes, because it's online. It's the digital version that's the real one. Here are two certificates. One is my doctoral certificate, which I have framed and on the wall, and it's on nice thick paper with a hologram and a university stamp. No one has ever asked me to take that out of my frame. They've all just believed me. It's sat there on my wall, okay? It is real, but it might not be, who knows? The second one on the left is my daughter, who's 11. We found this scrumpled up in her badge, a head teacher's award, yeah? We had to take it out of the bag and put it on the fridge, yeah? I'm really proud of this. Is my daughter really proud of that? <laughs> Maybe not. So the value of a badge or certificate is in the eye of the beholder. You can't control all that. You can put head of school award. You can make it into a big deal. But if the person doesn't care, they don't care. So here's two different sides of badges. Let's imagine this is recognition. And let's imagine this is credentialing. This is some work we did for City and Guilds just to try and help them understand different kinds of badges they could issue. So you could belong to a group or an organization. It might be like a, a new working group. It might be a trade union. It could be anything you wanted. I'm a member of this organization. It might confer uh, status. It might confer entrance. It might confer um, validity, whatever it needs to confer. Recognition. Participation, getting a badge for coming here today, getting a badge for um, turning up, getting a badge for just getting your sleeves rolled up and getting involved in something. These are badges of recognition. These are badges that people give to each other to say, I really appreciated that, or you're in the club. The ones on the right-hand side are the kinds of ones that would usually be issued in the L&D space. Like the ones, oh, you've reached the standard, you've finished your um, compulsory training course, you've, you've managed to get to this particular level, and then we're going to hold back some badges and, and uh, credentials for mastery. So only the top 5% of people are going to do this. City and Girls do this through their ampersand awards. You know, you get a certificate, but you also get a badge. Yeah? So we're going to hold back some as being rare badges for absolutely top performers. It could be in a sales thing, it could be in a, a learning thing, whatever you want. So recognition versus credentialing. Top down versus kind of peer to peer and feeling the support of the people around you. So I said earlier that the value of a badge is in the eye of the beholder. It's not entirely in the, in the, in the value of the, it's not entirely in the eye of the beholder. Um, let's just think about some different things that go into a badge. So first of all, there's who issued it. Is it a university? Is it your organization? Is it Bob from accounting? Is it your mom, right? Who is it who's issuing the badge? Secondly, who, what's the badge for? Is it for something massive? Is it for something small? Is it for something you can do? Is it for something you know? What is this badge for? Has it been endorsed? 
So yes, you issued the badge, but then it's been endorsed by your organization. Yes, your organization issued the badge, but it's been endorsed by Harvard University. What's the endorsement value of this badge? What, what's the journey value? Is this a start of me learning to play the guitar? Or is this me now being like Eric Clapton? Bad example, he's a fascist. Um, so, you know, where is it on this journey? Someone was using the example of um, the McDonald's badge. You know, people literally getting physical gold stars as they used to. I don't know if they still do. On their, you know, how far are they along in this, uh, this journey? But then, like I said before, you can put all of your time into this, but if someone doesn't like your organization, if someone doesn't like you, if they don't think badges are important, they're not gonna care, yeah, and you can't control that. You can control all these things, but you can't control the view of perception. So what we're trying to do, we are open, and it's taken me a while to get to this point, is we're trying to keep badges weird. And by weird, we mean like focusing on the recognition side of it. Issuing badges that are credentials is easy. Anyone can do it. You just replace certificates with badges. You just say, you finished that course, here's a badge. That's easy. Issuing badges for recognition is hard because you have to think about what people want and you have to think about like team formation, about um, community, that kind of thing. So if you're interested in this, you can earn this badge here uh, by joining the Keep Badges Weird community. It's on our, one of our clients' platforms, uh, Participate, but anyone can join. We run monthly community calls and we've got different kinds of badges, so recognition badges. So um, this is a badge for joining the community and introducing yourself. This is a badge for going and helping someone else in a different community. This is reflecting on your own learning. This is learning about communities of practice. This is learning about badges. And this is like helping other people within the community kind of understand things a little bit more. So trying to think about recognition and, and keeping badges a weird way. Just to finish off, how long have I got, Anthony? Cool. You might be sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, this sounds amazing but it seems like a long journey to get to where we are now as an organization, to where this might actually be a reality. So I want to introduce you to the concept of the Trojan mouse. I used to be a history teacher, so um, let me just give you a quick pot of history. Um, the Greeks were attacking the Trojans, and uh, they were having a bit of a time of it. They were laying siege to the city of Troy. They weren't getting anywhere, so they pretended to run away and gave the, the Trojans a big wooden horse as a gift. Spoiler alert, when the, Trojan wooden, when the wooden horse went into Troy, there was actually a bunch of Greek soldiers in there who um, went about their business, and it didn't end well for the Trojans. So a Trojan horse is something pretending to be something that it's not. And usually, if you try and do this in your organization, people spot this a mile off. Oh, you want to do this initiative? We see what's behind that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they see that coming a mile off. So instead, Trojan mice, little things pretending to be other things, little experiments. Um, this is not an original thought. This is not something which I've come up with. I used to follow someone on Twitter when I used to be on Twitter, um, that very corporate social media platform now owned by Elon Musk. Um, what's the punt? Yeah. Um, so this was from about 10 years ago, I think. And they came up with, with uh, five different types of Trojan mice. The, the obvious Trojan mouse. So we're gonna badge participation. We're gonna badge finishing courses. We're gonna badge something which is like obvious, a credential. We're gonna badge um, oblique things. So things which are from left field. We're gonna badge um, people bringing their dogs to work. I don't know, anything you want. Just something which is completely different, just for a bit of a laugh. We're gonna do naive badges. Oh, what if we issued badges for uh, people coming to the office? Or if you're best, like whatever, something that's really naive. Badges for conflict. Oh, what if we issued badges which were in opposition to our core business model? Um, badges which you think are going to fail. Badges that you think no one are going to want. Just try all different kinds of little badges for different projects and see what works. So little cheap experiments that don't require a new badges initiative in your organization, which is doomed to failure. Little things which are meeting people where they're at. Because what you're trying to do is not just to enhance your current practice, it's to transform it into something which is going to be you know, the new world of work, as we were hearing before. And if you learn nothing from this session, nothing at all, apart from this, just listen to this bit. This is the most important thing that you need to do, the do my users care-ometer. So when you're thinking about a badge, just think, how far up the scale is this going to go? 
it totally makes sense for me as the person issuing the badge, would anyone care about earning this badge? Yeah, so the do my users careometer is the focus for any small badging initiative. How to get started? I can see the energy slightly draining from the room, so let me just finish off. How to get started? Two things. First of all, minimum viable badge. Some of you will be familiar with the phrase minimum viable product. Minimum viable badge, what's the smallest badge that you could issue to someone that they would care about? Bearing in mind that there's no such thing as a lightweight badge, really, because all badges have meaning, because your experiences have meaning. Badges can accrete in value over time, just like the seabed, you know? Um, a, a badge might become more important over time because you were an OG, like we found before, like an original gangster. Um, they might have a multiplication factor. This badge with this one with this one means something because this person has been to lots of events and therefore is maybe good at networking, like implicitly. Um, and the network effects, but people in your network earning this badge. Oh, it seems like people who earn that badge seem to be pretty awesome. It seems to be like a signal for people who know what they're talking about. So there's no such thing as a lightweight badge. Think about the smallest possible badge that you could issue someone and maybe just issue it to them. Yeah, just for a laugh. So th some advice. Do call them whatever you want. You don't have to call them open badges if badges isn't a thing in your organization. Call them digital credentials, call them micro-credentials, call them what, medallions, you know, call them whatever you want. Secondly, um, don't just create a badging program. Add value to the people that you're trying to help through projects. Align with existing standards. If there's a standard in this area, align with it. Talk to people at other organizations who are doing similar things. Don't just issue images. The metadata is important. If you issue images, people can just right click on it and then copy it and pretend that they've got it. The metadata proving that someone's got the badge is important. Secondly, as I've said, don't create a badging program and just expect things to change magically. Change management is hard. You have to meet people where they are. And thirdly, don't, as I've said many times, don't just focus on what works for you as the issuer. Yes, you want this thing, this metric to go up but you need people to care about that metric going up or by something else that you're doing. I promised I would talk about verifiable credentials and blockchain, so here we go. Are the eyes still open? Yes, I think they are. Verifiable credentials. I've already mentioned the World Wide Web Consortium. W3C has a verifiable credentials standard. This is going to be huge. In, by 2030, I predict, that not only will you have your physical passport, physical driving license, you will have the digital version of you which is issued to you by an authority like the government or the DVLA. These things will be issued to you. Because if you think about what's happening at the moment, if you need to prove something like a passport or driving license, you have to take your analog driving license or passport and you have to somehow scan that in. I was in Croatia on holiday two weeks ago and I had to scan my passport and give it to my Airbnb host which I was really uncomfortable with because they've now got a copy of my passport. But if it was a digital one, I could give them access to that as view only at any time. So verifiable credentials are a separate thing to open badges, but they're coming together in the next version of the open badges standard. So not only will you have passports, driving licenses, that kind of thing as verifiable credentials, but you'll have any badges that you want to issue can be verifiable credentials as well. So you've already seen this image. This is the kind of the way that things work now with Open Badges version 2.1. With version three, I'm just going to come back to that one in a moment. With version three, the big difference is going to be this bit here, the verifiable data registry. Now, before your eyes glaze over, this is all about identity. So the, one of the biggest problems with Open Badges as they currently stand is that they're mostly issued to people's email addresses. Now, people lose their email addresses when they move organizations or if they leave university or whatever. You don't have to issue badges to email addresses, but most people do. This thing here, never mind blockchain, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Never mind blockchain, the important thing is identity. So decentralized identifiers or DIDs don't have to be on a blockchain and they're controlled by you, which means you create a wallet, anyone who's got any cryptocurrency, Web3 kind of stuff will kind of understand the concept of a wallet, like an online wallet. Um, and then you can show different verifiable credentials to different people. Now again, this does not have to be blockchain based. It can, there's different standards for this, which allow you to control a decentralized identifier that isn't tied to your email address. 
Now it's cryptographically verified as being under the control of you and you can put different identity documents into it. And that's the important thing about the, the future of open badges and verifiable credentials. It's the identity part, not trying to put the credential onto a blockchain. Like we've already solved making sure that this credential was issued to this person. The important bit is that we move away from email addresses. That's the important bit. So yes, you can put badges on a blockchain, but it's not solving the problem that you think it is. It's not solving the problem of validation. The problem of validation is already solved by the existing badges uh, platform. There are many different badges blockchain platforms. There's nothing wrong with them. If you want to use them, go ahead. But it's not solving the problem that you think it is because the problem is the identity problem, which is going to be solved in version three of the open badges standard. So this base document, um, or I put this month, but it's, it's 10th of March, the first version, the base document on the IMS website. Um, the next version will go on next month, and they'll keep on iterating the standard to be in alignment with verifiable credentials. And if you're really interested in this, because I'm not going to go into a lot of technical detail, Kerry Lemoy, who was at Badger, and she's not joining in structure, so she's available for hire. She is awesome, um, a developer, but also has a PhD in kind of digital humanities. Have a look at her presentation with Justin. She's a good friend of mine. Have a look at the spec on GitHub and join the W3C VC Ed Working Group, Verifiable Credentials Education Working Group. It's not just formal education, it's people like you and me. Um, and Kerry runs that group. So have a look. If you're interested in helping shape or just interested in how things are going, join the working group. Have a look at this presentation. It goes into more technical detail than I've got time to go through here. But just understand it's the identity bit that we need to fix on the web in general. It's not the like ever more verified credential side of things. So this is me. This is loading slowly. My slides are at bit.ly forward slash ltuk22 badges. You can find out more about the co-op that I'm part of at weareopen.coop. You can email me anytime. I'll always reply, doug at weareopen.coop. Um, I'm not on Twitter, but I am on Fosterdon, which is one of the Mastodon servers if you're experimenting with decentralized social networking. And also, I'm just at dougbellshaw.com if you want to find out more about me. I've got some spare slides in case people want to stick around, but I believe that's pretty much me finishing on time. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.